Hello and welcome to the podcast today where we're featuring business leaders who grow their own food. Yeah, I know, crazy, right? Uh, you'll just be shocked to discover this simple technique that really successful entrepreneurs, high-powered executives, and business leaders are using to reduce stress and uh, keep their sanity and to stay connected to something really tangible in a world that is rapidly changing. Uh, my name is Marjorie Wildcraft. I'm the founder of the Grow Network, and we are a movement of people who are stopping the destruction of the earth via homegrown food. You know, the commercial food production, um, as much as we're grateful for its existence, it's really, really destructive to the earth. And, um, you know, growing it in your backyard is an awesome way to help that. Anyway, today on our call, we have an amazing woman. Uh, Heather Briggs, who is the CTO at Strider. This is a really interesting, we're going to have uh, Heather talk a little bit about her business. Um, but um, really amazing woman. And uh, Heather, welcome to the call. Thank you so much, Marjorie. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm actually so excited to talk to you about food. It's my second favorite thing besides horses. Nice. Yes. Yeah, me too. Oh, well, maybe the first thing in horses, but... Heather, why don't you just tell people, you, you know, your full name, your position, and what your company does, how long ago it was started, and how many people are are involved in the company, so people can get a get a get an idea of the size of your operation. Okay. Well, again, like you said, my name is Heather Briggs. I am the chief technology officer of a company called Strider. It was founded in late 2015. It is a community-based equestrian event entry platform, um, and it has a very unique beginning story. Our founder and um, CEO, Tara Swarzy, spent about 10 hours trying to enter a clinic he had heard of off a Facebook post and just couldn't enter, couldn't enter, couldn't find it. She was looking for a needle in a haystack. It was from somebody who told her something, and there just isn't really an organic way to find um, a lot of horse of entry anywhere around. So in your neighborhood, you had no idea that there was somebody down the street that was hosting something until you saw it out in front, and you're like, man, I wish I knew about that. So we uh, we have an entry platform that enables organizers without any technical knowledge or capabilities to create, post, manage, and take payment for entries, all the while providing SEO optimization so their event has more exposure beyond the traditional audience they would have captured. So 90,000 users later, you can enter wow. anything from, yeah, it's amazing, right? Anything from webinars. Uh, we do offer some like professional development, like what type of insurance you'd need to have a safe event, to entering a clinic with a uh, rider like Peter Wilde, who is an Olympian. So we have a little bit of everything for everybody. Um, my favorite is the Land Safe Clinics. There is literally a way to fall correctly, and it does not have to be off a of war. So for those of you <laughs> getting a little older, I highly recommend the Land Safe Clinics. So come and check out our listings at striderpro.com. Nice. Yeah. And and yeah. about how many people are in the organization? That sounds amazing. So 90,000 members, that's a pretty significant platform. It is, yeah. Um, we have a team of eight over three continents doing everything from full stack development, um, UX, UI design to marketing communications and partnership development. So, And I have to say, we are a proud organization of primarily women. We only have, we have, two, we now have two men on a team of eight. So, yeah. That's, we're, that's we're pretty similar to that. the Grow Network, actually. Yeah, we we're, I think we're at about 10 now. We have two guys. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the whole networking, because we're also a network, it seems to be a a, a women business type, uh, something that, that we're attracted to. But I have to say, looking at your website, the pictures of the horses are just so gorgeous. And I'm totally going to confess to being a horse person and uh, looking forward to getting to do more of that. Um, but Heather, this is all about growing food. So like chief technical officer, so you're handling web stuff and complicated technical stuff and everything, but you've been growing your own food. How long have you been growing your own food? 
We've been growing our own food for about 15 years. Um, we moved from a slightly more urban environment to a farm when we decided that we were going to start breeding horses and uh, really kind of move a little bit more into uh, an agricultural type lifestyle, but I couldn't quite give up my technical stuff. So I've been taking piecemeal projects on and off for years and this opportunity with Strider came up and I just couldn't resist. But I, food will always be part of my, my passion because um, I like to know, I like to know where things come from. I like to know how things work. Um, that's, it marries nicely with my technical desire, but uh, food is, you know, food is your life, your sustenance. Um, so I think it's important that you take some active involvement in your your betterment and what you put in there. So we we do a lot of food growing on on the farm, and everybody who's here t- participates. Like uh, I have clients that participate. Um, all of the workers that live and reside on the farm. Um, we have about a staff of twenty. Um, during the the season, so we all participate and do a little bit. Um, many hands make light work, especially when we ha- when you have a larger area and we have a fairly large growing area. So, yeah. Oh well, so this this sounds like a uh, like a uh, actually a commercial farm operation then. In a, uh, um, a- we do, but I the food is only for the people that live and work on the on the farm. Oh, so nice. we grow our own produce to sustain our own little little city. Um, we were doing it a little bit more commercially oh, 10 years ago now. Um, we were selling at the farmer's market down the street. But it, if you don't do a lot of farmer's markets, like day to day, like we were having a hard time. Um, we only wanted to pick for optimum ripeness and like freshness and stuff. And there is an optimum time to pick everything. So you didn't want to pick it too early and, or too late. So with only doing one, it just really wasn't working for us. And we're like, you know what? There's enough to supply just the people on the farm. That's what we're going to do. So we trade with our neighbors. Sometimes our neighbors make something that we don't have. So we do a little bit of trade, but it's pretty much just for it's, a, we consider it a benefit to working on, uh, on the farm. Nice. And and where, what part of the country are you in? So we have a rough idea of your bioregion and growing seasons. Okay. So we are in Virginia. We're not, too, we're about an hour and 15 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. So uh, a really nice grow zone six. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to raise pretty much anything we want. Yeah. Lots of moisture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. And what, what systems are you using? I, I'm guessing a gardening, chickens, um, foraging. Um, yeah, we, we don't do, we don't do a lot of foraging. Um, primarily our gardening system is just soil based. We do, um, Raised beds, in-ground beds, uh, something, we have a lot of hard Virginia red clay. Uh, some things do better in that we don't, we don't like, we're a no-till kind of thing. Um, yeah. We add some composted material that we, we keep here on the farm, obviously, because we have lots of space to rotate and, you know, add soil additives and such. But um, some of the more delicate things will raise in, in raised beds, like our lettuces and stuff. But our um, garlic, onions, potatoes, that all goes into the ground. Corn does really well in the ground. Sunflowers, that just goes straight in there. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. So usually the most systems are, yeah, the raised beds for the, for the, the closer in kitchen garden type, you know, the mm-hmm. vegetables. And then the, the calorie crops, what I call them, the bigger the bigger crops exactly yeah for in the in ground right do you do you have any livestock though other and of course i'm i'm bet that you've got some horses and you're getting some fabulous horse manure so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we we do get fabulous horse manure um no we don't do any other livestock um we do bed on straw for a very specific reason we are close to uh we're very you know not yeah, close as relative, but Delaware, which is a very large mushroom producing state. And I have a gentleman that picks up all of my horse manure in straw, takes it away, and then returns me mushrooms. So I oh, get about nice. 60 pounds of mushrooms returned to me by giving him what he needs to make his crops, which is basically horse manure on on straw. So 
yeah, we we love the mushroom man. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. What Heather? What are your favorite things to produce of of all the different things you're growing there? What What are your personal favorites? Oh, my favorite things to produce are chogia beets, um, both because of the swirled color. So visually, Ooh. it just makes me happy. The taste is always awesome, but they're they're my favorite things to can. Um, I love them all year round. Just a nice vinegar base. Oh, so delicious. Oh, nice. You know, you know what I love about beets is is you can get kids to eat beets. You know, if you tell them you eat these mm-hmm. red beets. And then your, you know, your poop and your pee is going to come out colored, and they'll eat it. They'll eat a bunch of it just to see that, right? You know, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally, I, I totally hear you on that one. Um, and I actually saw your syrup video on elderberries. We do, we make our own syrup and elderberry jam. Um, but I put mine oh, nice. through a food mill before the cheesecloth. <laughs> Yeah, I bet I bet you would get yeah I bet you get some good elderberries to grow there. They would like mm-hmm. that zone. Yeah, nice. Yep. Heather, about how much time are you spending each day? Uh, just just curious for for how much time you're 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 spending out there gardening. Um, so in my garden we have about a a one acre plot which includes our little fruit orchard. So we spend mm-hmm. about. 15 minutes a day uh, at max during the growing season though it's it's more like dedicated blocks of like two or three times a week for a few hours. Um, There's always some weeds, there's some harvesting, there's some pruning. Um, But average out, I can't say more than maybe 15 minutes a day. Um, We also start, there's not really an end season. We start all of our seeds in January. So, um, yeah, we have a a small greenhouse that we we are lucky enough um, to have that we, we start our little seedlings in January. So there's never really a downtime, which is nice because I'm never missing it quite so far. It's never so far away that I'm like, oh, I wish it was warmer. We have an opportunity to to kind of work and keep our hands in the dirt all year round, which is really, really nice. Yeah, it sure is. What would you say is the biggest benefit other than the, the produce? Ooh, the biggest benefit other than the actual produce is um, obviously the relaxation and a quiet place to think. Um, I also use it business-wise um, to kind of structure how I make my project plans and such, watching something take shape over time, having a vision of what I intended and what was the reality of that that intent, um, being in control but not being in control. So I put the same energy and devotion into the care of everything um, that we plant, but sometimes it just doesn't turn out. So I can always take the lessons learned in my gardening and apply it to my my day job, if you will. Um, wow, you know what? Yeah, that's amazing. You know, first of all, you're 100% alignment with everybody we've interviewed in terms of like, they don't take their electronics out there. It's a time to relax and de-stress and and just get in touch with themselves. But I'm, I've been hearing this theme more and more, and it's funny, you know, because of course, as, as a CTO or CEO or you know, a high-powered business leader, it's really interesting. I've been hearing this theme of it's somewhere where I'm not I'm I'm not really in control. <laughs> I guess <I'm> yeah. <laughs> we're gonna have to have work with get get together with uh, Freud and Jung on that one and. <laughs> what they got to say about that (laughs) do you have any tips that you'd like to share with other uh other growers that um or other uh other busy executives that might be thinking about this or even just anybody that would be listening to the podcast it's always interesting me to the different advice that comes up um i guess my main tips would be to read 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 but don't also forget to just do it, do it, do it. Um, I think people get panicky about trying to recreate everything all at once. So just try one thing. Um, your garden doesn't have to be 20 different varieties of this and that. You know, start with one thing. Add a second if you are so adventurous. Um, I have a few friends that get riled up when they have to start keeping track of too many things. So this shouldn't be something where you are stressing about you know, um, having so many things to take care of. So just try one thing and expand it or don't. Um, 
yeah, I don't plant any tomatoes because I have a dear friend that's got 20 types of tomato plants, and she became flustered when she tried to grow a variety of things. So she just upped the ante on what she really liked was heirloom tomatoes. Um, the other tip is water. I think a lot of people tend to overwater. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so what, definitely kind of keep track of the water. Stick your finger in the soil. Test it, you know. Grapes, for instance, do best with the struggle. It makes the sweetest grapes when they're slightly underwatered. So learn the dance of nature. Um, you know, anything too much one way or the other makes not good produce and not good vegetables. So it's, you know, get familiar with that dance. Wow. That's, I love that. Thank you. That's very well said. Having been growing food in desert regions for the past 20 years, I have a little bit of the opposite problem, but water is also the key. It's the crux. (laughs) We're often not quite watering enough, but um, yeah, but I can see on the East coast where, and, and possibly, you know, on the West coast too, where, where, you could easily overwater. Absolutely. Yeah. And then that, that you Container know, you come, gardens. Yeah. yeah, you come equipped with that uh, digital water uh, meter, which is your index finger. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. Just, yeah. It, it's it free. You carry it with you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You just stick it in there. It's all good. Yeah. A nice skewer, a nice bamboo skewer also works well if you are well manicured. So. Oh, yeah. Ah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, Heather, why should other companies encourage more backyard food production by their leaders and staff? Oh, companies should definitely encourage more backyard food production. It makes um, it makes for a more well-rounded person, employee. Um, they understand a beginning, a middle, and an end, um, planning, and how, again, things can go awry. Um, you can foster a community with disparate groups and people and bring them together by maybe doing a CSA in your, if you're a larger company, I mean, I'm a little bit spread out, but we do share our stories of what we are growing and what we're working with. Our um, COO has chickens and goats, so she does goat milk and eggs. So we live vicariously through pictures and stories, but yeah, you can, you can definitely encourage um, more of a community experience and, and sharing and stories. Some of that has been, I guess, removed from our daily work life. Um, and it's nice to re- be able to reintroduce it, even if it's just virtually. So, Wow, beautifully said. Yeah, thank you. So as you know, with the Grow Network, we're on a mission to have more uh, backyard food production as 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 a part of everybody's daily life. And now that we have so many people who are remote workers, and they don't need to travel that hour or two in their car. <laughs> they can now spend it in their backyard growing food. So that's awesome. Exactly. Heather, thank you so much for joining us on the call today. And then, uh, so let's say I have a beautiful horse and I'm wanting to get it into enter, go enter into an event. How, how would I reach you again for, and, and what kind of events do you have posted there? Uh, Strider Pro, S-T-R-I-D-E-R Pro dot com is the website. Um, and just look at our calendar. We have, again, everything from webinars, personal development, educational opportunities, clinics, horse shows. Just search the calendar and the world is your oyster. That it's a and, and I have to say from from surfing around on the website, the images are just fantastic. So being a being a horse lover, it really appealed to my heart. Thank you so much for being on the call today, Heather. You're welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Marjorie. It was nice Uh, speaking with you. All right. This is Marjorie Wildcraft with the Grow Network, and uh, you can grow your own food. We'll catch you on the next podcast. The Grow Network is a movement of people who are stopping the destruction of the earth via homegrown food.